right now. One is, um, we're going to chat about this later on, which is, uh, how do you keep concentration during Taravi Salah? Particularly, I want to know that. WhatsApp us right away, um, 0617660355. So, like, what's the magic about keeping your concentration during that long session of Taravi Salah? I want to know, 0617660355. The other is, what do you make of how has South Africa changed uh, since 1652? Because it's 370 years today that Jan van Riebeck arrived in our country. Uh, what impact uh, has his arrival made to our country? And how do you think the country would be like if he had not arrived? Because he would have certainly changed. I would not be speaking Afrikaans for sure. That's one thing, right? And, and we can talk about the English as well later on. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, in fact, we're going to get to that now. Dr. Tsefa Malloy with me is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Ali Mazruni Center for Higher Education Studies uh, in Johannesburg. Uh, Dr. Malloy, I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining me. Assalamu alaikum and good morning to your listeners. Well, welcome, Salam. It's great that you, you, you know, you're, you're part of the Ali Mazuri Center for Higher Education because Ali Mazuri, I mean, he himself is, is an absolute legend uh, on the African continent, I think globally in terms of his understanding of the triple heritage that he often speaks about for Africa, right? But uh, which then I think is an interesting segue into what we're talking about, right? So, uh, Jan van Riebeck. Uh, arrived in the Cape uh, 270 years ago today. Uh, my question to you is like, on reflection, uh, how has his arrival changed the history of, of South Africa or the Cape or Southern Africa? Okay. Um, once again, I think you raise a very thorny topic in terms of history of Africa. Um, the first thing that Jan van Riebeck's name does in, in the context of South Africa is he, he thought our history completely. So most historians begin the history of South Africa in 1652 when Jan Van arrived. Very problematic. Um, it needs to be said that there were three previous um, European nations that arrived before Jan Van and And here we must be particular. The Portuguese, um, then you had the British, and then you had the Dutch with, with Jan van Riebeck. So um, we need, before we talk van Riebeck, we need to acknowledge that, you know, there were these other European nations that failed past the case. Now, what makes Jan van Riebeck um, stand out is that he marked the first European, um, European representative um, under, of course, the VOC what was called the Dutch East India Company. They, they basically became the first settlers. And this is where distortion and the involvement of the history of South Africa would take a different turn from what it was prior to their arrival. Mm. And, and, that, and that different turn, what, what sort of turn? I, mean, just, just, I think we know, but we need, to, we need to be able to punctuate what sort of turn and how did it change our history? So first and foremost, um, we we began with immediate effect to start having what you would like to call land, land possession issues. So, you know, they, they, they possessed the land forcefully against what problematically they call the hot and tot, which we know is a derogative name now. Um, they should have been called the Khoi Khoi or the Sand people. And then secondly, the issues of racism um, came up, uh, begun in earnest. Um, and so, you know, today we think he, he has bequeathed that kind of demon upon our society. <laughs> and then language, um, you say Afrikaans. Um, Afrikaans as a language in itself is not really a problem. The issue is how Afrikaans would become used as a medium of instruction in our curriculum you know, um, very forced, you know, uh, because of the conqueror's way. And again, so we sit with this problem. Today you have a Stellenbosch University, <laughs> which which is struggling with what they call the Talbalai, uh, which is the dual medium instruction. They still cling on to Afrikaans as an intellectual language. Um, and then governance. We, we basically were forced to follow how the Europeans, you know, operate in terms of governance. And, you know, you look at our parliament, 
if you think about the union building, it's called the union building because it's the union between the British and the poor. <laughs> when they signed the Permiechen Minutes in 1902, you know, so again, again, they that superiority on black people uh, or people of, of color. So, you know, here you think of, of, of also the Indians, the colors. So, so all these issues, you know, he, he basically is the star. Um, mm. Most of the issues that we are struggling with today. So how how do we do how do we undo all of it? I mean I know you know that needs maybe a one hour conversation, but um, but just in terms of now, right? Uh, you know uh, I mean I'm just looking at something that that Dr. Samar Dodafi can in fact sent me today, which I think is is really worth repeating. He says you know to colonize a people's mind, you must first demonize their culture, then their traditions, and and I think in fact that's what you've just su suggested. There's been a long period of humanization of, of the culture of people, right? How, how do we begin to start reversing that? So, in a nutshell, you're asking me how do we think about decolonizing ourselves? <laughs> no, how, how do I, how, well, yeah, well, yeah, okay. Yeah, how do we decolonize the South African society to the leaders arrive? Now, now, there's a lot of ways we can do this, but unfortunately, we sit with a political system that really is problematic in itself is your Um So you have a situation where uh, you could be a brilliant individual in South Africa regardless of your race, but because of your race and your class, your ideas will not go that far. Um, or, or they will go far because of your race and your class as well. Meaning because you've got money or you have the right skin color. So what we what we need to do when we think about decolonizing is we need to think about the system, the system that dictates what is possible in the South African country. We're not in an island, we're part of the global community. So we need to think with what is, you know, we need to think locally um, in as much as we, and we must act locally as much as we consider what is international. Uh, so, of course, the big one here be our education system. That is where we need to invest a lot of what we think our ideas of decolonizing the South African community should be. Um, once we can get that one, everything else is up to implementation. Unfortunately, I don't really have much um, optimism in that regard because we have everybody sitting in those positions who don't belong there. Okay, lots to reflect on that, and, and uh, maybe that's a good way, good way we're talking about it today. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and, and I'm sure, uh, you know, this, well, this could well mark the beginning of another whole conversation um, around decolonization, and that day, 6th of April, 1652. Thank you, thank you for your time, most appreciated. Thank you, Ashraf, have a jolly good well, morning. Absolutely, where are you on? Lots to talk about there. Now that's the that's the one take that we that we have on that one. Let's get let's get to another. I mean, that's the, that of course is Stephen Moroy from the uh, postdoctoral research fellow at uh, the Ali Mazdoui Center for Higher Education at UJ. That's one for. Let's get, however, uh, another perspective, and this comes from the EFF because there's a degree of activism that's taking place today. I understand, uh, particularly in uh, in Stellenbosch. So with me is uh, Nazir Paulson, is a member of Parliament for the EFF. Nazir, appreciate your time. Salam alaikum. Good morning. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to you and the audience of Salam Media and Ramadan Kareem to everyone, to yourself, your families. Shukran so much. Um, I must I must uh, start by saying, um, Brother Ashraf, it's a, it's a great honor for me to be interviewed by you. You're very kind. Better than, than being on Twitter with, with people like yourself and uh, Hassan Tabada, right? This is very different. <laughs> For Ramadan Ahumdi, anyway, right? That's, uh, that's appreciated, by the way. But let's talk about, I mean, so, so there's activism taking place by, by the EFF today. Where is it taking place? Why so? It's going to take place um, in front of uh, one of Johan Rupert's farms in Stellenbosch. And I think... The symbolism is is that we've always uh, speaking about the fact that uh, about the disposition of of African land and you know it's it's uh, 
this position is a very nice word, it's very diplomatic, it's actually the theft of African land, and that's the cardinal sin of European um, arrival uh, in the country, is the theft of land, and we need to actively um, advocate for the uh, for the expropriation of land without compensation. And I so, 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 therefore, to get this right, your purpose today, I mean, there's a specific reason why you are there today, right? Uh, and I've made the point, 6th of April, 1652, uh, all those years ago. So why today? Why outside one of uh, Johann Rupert's farms? Uh, and what are you expecting out of the protest today? Uh, uh, first thing, Johann Rupert is probably the wealthiest man in South Africa. And, and his wealth is based on land and the access to land and in a nutshell land theft if it wasn't for white colonizers to take african lands we would not have this rampant poverty amongst african people black people and and as an example a country in africa that was never colonized ethiopia is probably more advanced than South Africa or, or just as advanced and they've never been colonized they colonized and there hasn't been this great um, European influence in Ethiopia and yet it's a fantastic uh, society to live in without influence of Europeans so for Europeans to say that they've contributed to our advancement is is a myth because um, what Europeans did when they came to South Africa was to completely dismantle systems that existed already. People didn't just live uh, casually. They lived by, by existing systems and systems that they developed to suit their needs and suit the, mm -hmm. the people that lived here. And then when Jan van Riebeek arrived, it was the beginning of the dismantling of existing African systems. Then. Okay, so I get that. So, so therefore, what do you want to get out of today? I mean, I know there's a short-term goals, there's long-term so goals. We need, to, we need to highlight the fact that all of the wealth of the likes of Jan, Johan Rupert is based on land theft, the illegal possession of African lands. Uh, too much of it. Uh, Johan Rupert has got more land than he could ever need for, and he's got more money than he could ever need in in many lifetimes. it's uh, So an oligarch like Johan Rupert should be exposed for the person that he is. Wealth at the expense of, of the comfort of African people. And, 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 the yes. and, the, and the labor and the sweat of African people. And I take it up and it is a symbol for, for so much in terms of, 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 of the point about dispossession and, and wealth building, I get that, right? Uh, how so so he's one in the in the broader scheme and this is my last question how, how do you seriously go about dismantling the injustice that has been done over these years but at the same time ensuring that the that the country is a running country that will serve the best interests of of all of its people well you know this this is what, one thing that that is that these colonizers especially white colonizers tell us is that if we if we expropriate land without compensation it's going to affect the economy. how would it affect the economy it doesn't mean people are not going to buy our minerals they're still going to buy our minerals the only difference is is that we'll be able to set the terms because we'll be fully in possession of the of the land where everything is produced where everything is extracted Okay, so that's it. It's a, it's a, it's really, it's um, it's really trying to blackmail us from, to back down from our generational mission, which is to attain economic freedom, and it starts with the expropriation of land without compensation for equal redistribution in use. And I, and I take it from the EFF point of view specifically, maybe the words uh, in our lifetime in inverted commas needs to be emphasized. But I certainly got that. Uh, and please, Nazim Paulson, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And, and let's see what happens. I mean, this is just for salvo, uh, fascinating uh, position. I, and you may want, want to ask the question uh, so the EFF is doing this, and yet they have their own views about how they do it. But you wonder how come 
where are the other political parties uh, and, and other movements? Are they not picking up on the significance of the 6th of April, 1652, and what do we do about just that?